All right, as we continue to go through the book of Romans, I'm going to invite you to uh, turn with me to the chapter 1, and we're going to pick up in verse 18 with a uh, message entitled, Truth Decay. And uh, usually we don't have the children go back on a communion Sunday, and uh, as we go through this, I think you'll see why we asked them to, uh, to go back this morning. But if you stand with me to read the Word of God, we're going to read Romans chapter 1, picking up in verse 18. The Word of God declares, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for these words, and we just ask the whole, that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, would reveal to us more of the truth about Jesus Christ and the truth about ourselves and the truth about your amazing grace extended to each and every one of us this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Do you remember at one point, right before Jesus was crucified, he stood before the, Ro the Roman procurator, Pontius Pilate. And Pontius Pilate asked him this question. He said to Jesus very cynically, what is truth? What is truth? And that's a good question to ask today, isn't it? Because everybody that we're looking at around us on TV, they're asking that question. What is truth? And if you haven't noticed, there's an ever-increasing progression in our society of what I want to call Truth decay. Listen, 25 years ago, nobody would really have ever questioned the existence of objective truth. And when I say objective truth, that is truth that can be observed. And lately what's happened is truth is now subjective. Truth is however I feel, okay? And even lately it's emotional. Not only is it just what, whatever it is you think, it's, if I feel that it's wrong, then that's the truth. And you can just see this slow process of truth being eroded. I'm sure every one of us heard this statement. It may be true for you, but it's not true for me. You ever hear that, anybody? Yeah? But guess the only, you know, one of the only places that doesn't work is the bank. You go to the bank, you hand your paycheck to the teller, and imagine if she only gave you half your paycheck back and she said to you, well, my truth is that two quarters only equal a dollar, so I'm only going to give you half your paycheck back. It doesn't work, does it? No. Or if you stand before the judge and your clock going 80 miles an hour with the radar gun and you stand before the judge and you say, judge, I, I only felt like I was going 60 well, it doesn't work because the radar gun clocked you at 80. And you can see where this leads, right? We all rely on truth in our daily lives for everything. For example, if I put an uh, address into my phone, I want true directions to where I'm going, right? If I say, we're going to meet at this time, we are expected to be there at the true time. If you go to the doctor and you have tests run on you, don't you want the true results? And that brings us to the magical question again, which Pontius Pilate asked, what is truth? What is truth? Merriam-Webster says truth is this. Truth is that which has fidelity to the original. In other words, for it to be true, it must be the same or equal to the original. Let me give you an example. How do I know I have an eight ounce glass of water? I have to go to my measuring cup with the standard of measure on it 
and pour that glass, that eight ounces of water into that measuring cup and see if it measures up to the original standard of ounces. Then I can know for sure I have a true eight ounce glass of water. But what happens when we come to issues like morality and ethics? What is the, what is the measuring line that we use? Do we have a measuring line? And we do. Because all through the Word of God, you see God revealing Himself to us as the God of truth. He's over and over again, God says, I am truth. Jesus would say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. And Jesus would say, my word is truth. God's word and God himself is the plumb line, is the measuring stick which we use to judge morality and ethics. And here's the thing, friends. The further and further and further away we go from the truth, the more in bondage we become. We think we become freer, but the further away we move from truth, the more in bondage we become. And what is happening today in our society is there's a cultural narrative being portrayed where it says this, you can create truth for yourself. Each one of us can decide what is true for ourselves. And friends, that is the lie that happened in Genesis, way back in the book of Genesis, the first lie of the devil. He said to Adam and Eve, basically he said, you can be like God. You can decide truth for yourself. And that is exactly what we are seeing today within our society. But what happens when you abandon objective truth? Well, it leads down a dark road of destruction. In his book called Relativism, Having Your Feet Grounded in Midair, Gregory Kukul said this, The death of truth in our society has created a moral decay in which every debate ends with the barroom question, says who? Right? That's exactly what happens. You, if we go on this idea of everything, truth is relative, we have to say, well, if you come to me and say, well, that's wrong, says who? I don't think it's wrong. There's no standard. And once you do this, what ends up happening is nothing has transcendent value, not even human beings. And you say, how does this happen? How does this all happen? Well, we're going to see how this happens today as Paul is going to give to us the most descriptive chapter in the Bible describing the depravity, the dilemma, and the downward spiral of man found within the scriptures. And he begins for us with the wrath of God. Remember last week in verse 17, that we ended with this. Verse 17 of Romans, he said, the righteousness of God is revealed. And we love talking about the righteousness of God being revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. But look at verse 18. Something else now is revealed. The wrath of God is revealed. The wrath of God. Now when we talk about the wrath of God, it's not like man's anger. It's not impulsive. It's not sporadic. But it's rather a righteous anger. And remember last week we ended with saying, with Paul saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Now, why was he saying that? Because he knew what he was going to write. It's the wrath of God that causes many people to pull back and say, I'm not going to proclaim the gospel because it's the wrath of God that causes people to say, you're intolerant. You are hateful. But the thing is, God's wrath is compatible with God's character. Yes, God is merciful. God is gracious. God is good. But God is also holy. God is also righteous. And God is also just. And when you look at the idea of the wrath of God, it's not a topic that everybody wants to talk about. You never really see that out there in, in the world, right? We're going to do a 10-week study on the wrath of God. The church isn't going to fill up for that. Let's be honest. Nobody wants to talk about the wrath of God. 
But as you look at the wrath of God in the Old Testament, it's, also, it's, very, it's often pictured as a cup. The cup of God's wrath in Jeremiah 25, verse 15. It's pictured as a cup that is filling up slowly over time, then eventually it just overflows and flows over. And remember, that's what Jesus prayed in the garden, didn't he? Remember, he said, Father, if there's any possible way, let this cup pass from me. What was the cup? The cup was the wrath of Almighty God that he was ex going to experience. Now, this word wrath, it's the word orge, and it's used 10 times in 16 chapters in the book of Romans. And it speaks of God's righteous, holy anger after a period of long suffering. And the result is eternal condemnation for those who reject the means of salvation, which is the death of Jesus Christ. Because what happened on the cross of Calvary was Jesus Christ was nailed on that cross, his blood was spilled, and he experienced the holy wrath of God for our sin. And if you reject that substitutionary death, the wrath of God then falls upon you. Now the Bible does tell us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, a good verse to know. It says, God has not appointed us unto wrath, but to obtain salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, he doesn't want to pour his wrath out upon us. He loves us, and that's why he sent Jesus to take the wrath of God for us. But if you reject it, listen to what the Bible says. We all know John 3, 16, right? Everybody's, a lot of people's favorite verse, for God so loved the world. But look what it says in John chapter 3, verse 36. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe in the Son shall not see, see life, but the wrath of God abides in him. The wrath of God abides on him. And the book of Revelation describes it as the wrath of the Lamb. So who will experience the wrath of God? Paul tells us, verse 18, against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. What you're going to see here this morning is there's a downward spiral. There's stages of what I call this truth decay. And the first stage, number one, is a suppression of the truth. A suppression of the truth. Paul begins here with this decay process, and he says, the, uh, with against all ungodliness. What's ungodliness? Ungodliness has to do with our relationship to God. It's people who have no fear of God. It's not just the atheist who says, oh, I don't believe in God. It's the person who lives their life with no idea of God, no fear of God. They act as if Jesus Christ doesn't exist. That's what he's saying here. Then he says, unrighteousness. Unrighteousness is our relationship to other people. And somebody said, where there is irreverence for God, there is injustice toward man. And we can see that happening again today. So what Paul says here is they suppress the truth. Okay, What does it mean to suppress the truth? It means they know the truth. What they do is they take the truth, they stick it in a box, they put something over it, they try to cover it, they try to bury it, they try to extinguish it. It's an aggressive opposition to the truth. They acknowledge that it's there, but they try to cover it up. And we can see this happening today. We have all different type of ways to suppress the truth today. We have theories that suppress the truth. We have ideologies that suppress the truth. We have politics that suppress the truth. We have legislation that suppresses the truth. We have euphemisms that try to explain away God. We say things, well, that was just karma or that was destiny. No, friends, that was the hand of God moving in your life. That's what that was. Why is there such an aggression, such a, a active oppression of the truth? I think there's a few reasons. First of all, the truth hurts. 
A lot of people don't want to hear the truth because it hurts. Secondly, the truth has consequences. And thirdly, if there is truth, it demands a change in my life. And people don't want to hear that they have to change something about their life. So Paul says here, he says, look, every single one of us is guilty and every single person on the face of the planet is without excuse. And he's going to give us two reasons why. Because of conscience and because of creation. Look with me at verse 19 to 20. He says, verse 19, Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. He says, number one, you're without excuse because of your conscience sake for your conscience sake. Whether you live in suburbia, America, or whether you live in the jungles of South Africa, each and every one of us have been indwelt with a conscience, okay? Each and every one of us know instinctively what's right and what is wrong, right? So that means that there's a moral law written upon our heart. And if there's a moral law written upon our heart, there must mean that there's a moral lawgiver who is God who put that moral law within our heart. How do we know right from wrong? God put it into each and every one of us. And he says, because of that, you know right from wrong and you are without excuse. Second reason, he says, creation. Not only conscience, but your creation testifies to you. It says there, God's invisible attributes are clearly seen. Sort of a paradox right there. Invisible attributes, clearly seen. And all you have to do, friend, is look outside. You look around the world, and you have to be totally blind and totally ignorant to say, there's, what, there's no designer behind this amazing design? That would be like me telling you to take out your cell phone and say, that just randomly happened, didn't it? Of course it didn't. There's a designer behind de the design. Just the fact that we are moral, logical creatures, it means that there's a moral, logical creator. The creation testifies. The Bible says, the heavens declare the glory of God. John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and nothing was made that was made that He did not make. And Colossians 1.16 says, All things were created by Him and through Him, and in Him all things consist. That means all things are held together by the hand of God. Think about it for a moment. If God would just take His hand off this thing for just a second, what would happen? It would go out of control. Think for a moment if we were just a little bit closer to the sun, we'd fry. What if we were a little bit further away from the sun? We would freeze. And scientists are still trying to come up with ideas and explain these things and they say, oh, it's this cosmic glue or something. No, friends, God is holding it together. Friends, and even within the church of Jesus Christ, we're going further and further away from the truth. We're trying to suppress the truth, even within the church, and we come up with ideas like this. Theistic evolution. It says this. Well, God started it, and then evolution just took it the rest of the way. Again, the Bible does not teach that. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Friends, people are embracing the ideas. This is the reason. They want to be recognized in the halls of academia. They want to be looked at as scholars. But guess what? God calls it shameful. The creation testifies that there's a creator. Your conscience testifies that there is a creator. And Paul says here, so you are without excuse. First part of the decay suppression of the truth. Second part of the decay process is distortion of the truth. Verse 21, because although they knew God, 
They did not glorify him as God, nor were, thank, were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. So they suppress the truth, they deny God's existence, they don't glorify God, nor are they thankful, so who do they glorify? They glorify man. Again, man becomes, on, becomes sitting on the throne, and he gets to decide truth for himself. And they explain God away because they don't want to be accountable. So what do they do? It's easy just to, 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 to just distort the truth. Get God out of here so I don't have to be accountable for my actions. So here we see a dark digression of what happens to somebody. He says, first of all, they become futile in their thoughts. Futile in their thoughts. It means devoid of force. It doesn't measure up what it should be. Remember Solomon, we've been talking about Solomon a lot lately. Solomon had all the wealth, all the women, everything he could ever want. And towards the end of his life, he wrote the book of Ecclesiastics. And this is what he said. He said, I tried to find satisfaction in wealth. Couldn't find it. I tried to find satisfaction in knowledge. I couldn't find it. I tried to find satisfaction in wine. I couldn't find it. I tried to find satisfaction in women, and I couldn't find it. And, he, and you know what he concluded? He said, all of this, all these earthly pursuits are vanity upon vanity. They're chasing after the wind. And he said, this is what I conclude. The, the duty of man is to fear God and to keep his commands. Friends, how many people are living like this today, futile in their thoughts? They're chasing after success. They're chasing after sexual partners. They're chasing after degrees to hang on their wall. And in the big scheme of things, God says it's worthless. Futile in their thoughts. But look where it also leads. Not only a futility of thought, it leads to a, a darkened, foolish heart. Verse 21. What does it mean by a foolish, darkened heart? It means that their inner being is darkened. When you speak of the heart, it's the inner seat of all spirituality. The Bible tells us to guard our heart because out of it flows the issues of life. Friends, Jesus would even tell us that out of the heart, the mouth speaks. And, you know, oftentimes people say, oh, the, you know, he speaks terribly. His mouth is a mess. Friends, it's really not a mouth problem. It's a heart problem. And there's only one way to cleanse the heart, and that's the blood of Jesus and the purifying power of the Holy Spirit. So they have futile thoughts. They have foolish hearts. Thirdly, they become filled with pride. Verse 22, professing to be wise, they became fools. Okay? Professing to be wise, they became fools. When it says there they profess, it means they pretend or they allege to be wise, okay? Now, these are the people who have like five letters before their name. These are the so-called experts of our day. They profess to be so wise, but what does God call them? He says, fools. Psalm 14, verse 1 says, the man who says there is no God is a fool. And the word fool is where we get the word moron. He says, look, they think they're so wise, they think they're so smart, but guess what? They're fools because they reject me. They suppress the truth. They distort the truth. So here again, it leads to, this, to the next thing, which is false worship, verse 23. And change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, birds, four-footed animals, and creeping things. Do you see, you see where this is going? It starts with images made like corruptible man, and then it goes to animals, and then finally insects of the ground. Do you see how it just, just goes down and goes down and goes down? And when it says they changed, it literally means they caused something to cease and something else replaced it. What ends up happening is instead of man being made in God's image, we want to make God in our own image. And we see this happening all the time. Man becomes deified. We see it in success. We see it in sports. We see it in movie stars. We see it everywhere. 
And here's the scariest part, friends. This is the scariest part of this chapter. I think there's some of the, the most alarming verses in Scripture. When it says God's going to give them up three times. He's going to give them up, he's going to give them up, and then finally God's going to give them over. And that's a sad thing when God gives you over to the sin that will destroy you. And that's the third level of truth decay, the exchange of the truth. We see that in verse 24. <clears throat> Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forevermore. The first thing that we see, God gave them up to uncleanness. He gave them up to gross idolatry. What happens is they had the truth, right? They suppress the truth. They try to put it in a box. They stuff it down, but they realize they can't get rid of it. So what do they have to do? They have to replace it with something else, right? And friends, once you replace the truth with something, you open up Pandora's box because now anything goes. Any, any lie can be inserted into there and be claimed as truth because, friends, we can exchange the truth for a lot of lies because there's a lot of lies out there because you know who's behind it all? The father of lies, and that's Satan himself. Friends, there's things being exchanged today for the truth like this. Here's a lie that's being exchanged. All roads lead to heaven. Just be a good person. Do your best. That's a lie that has been exchanged for the truth. Here's another lie. Do whatever feels good. God just wants you to be happy. God won't judge you. God won't be upset about the, that sin. God loves you. That's a lie that has been exchanged for the truth. Or here's another one. You can make up your own religion. You can take a little bit of Buddhism, take a little bit of Hinduism, sprinkle some Jesus in there, and there you go. Guess what? That's a lie that's been ex exchanged for the truth. And God gives them over to uncleanness. That word uncleanness is moral defilement. And friends, all you have to do is look around and you can see moral defilement everywhere. Turn on the TV and you, just when you thought you saw something pretty horrible, 10 minutes later you see something even worse. Moral defilement is plaguing our nation. And, this is, and the next thing that happens after gross idolatry is sexual immorality. Verses 26 to 27. For this reason, here it is again, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another. Men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was do. He says here, secondly, he, he, God gives them up to vile passions. And it says their women exchange the natural use for what is against nature. And he starts with the women because women are generally more discreet. They're more reserved than men. And he says, this is how, this is how bad it's gotten. It's gotten so bad that the women are even rejecting what is natural and going to what is unnatural. And he says, he gave them up to these vile pas passions. And I want you to note, please, when we talk about homosexuality and lesbianism, I want you to notice what Paul is saying here. He's implying to us that this is a choice. Okay? He's saying here that this is a choice that people are making. Okay? They're not born this way. He's saying right here, it's a choice. They're choosing to go away from what is natural to that which is unnatural, and they're burning in their lust for one another. And friends, this is a lie that is being presented in our culture 
wholeheartedly, and people are embracing it with everything they have, and we're flying the flags over the Capitol. We have months dedicated to the whole thing, and we call it Gay Pride Month, but if you look what it says, God says here, he says, it's not prideful, it's shameful. And now what we have happening in our society is kids get to decide what they want to be, okay? I'm a girl. No, I think I'm a boy. No, I'm a boy. No, I think I'm a girl. And there's all this confusion. And here's the thing. God decides what you are when you're born, okay? God dictates that to you. But we see what's happening. We are getting to decide truth for ourselves. And it says here that they're burning in their lust for one another. The language literally means they're burning out, okay? People are trying to attempt to fulfill these needs by this sexual experience, but they only find how empty it really is. And I want to say this about homosexuality. The homosexual person needs Jesus Christ just as much as the heterosexual person needs Jesus Christ. Oftentimes what we in the church do is we categorize this sin like it's some type of special sin. And it's, it's not. It's just a, as much of a sin as a young couple living together before they're married, having sex, is called fornication. God had a design, and the design was before the fall of man, and it was for one man, for one woman, for one life. Anything outside of that, he calls sin, and he calls it an abomination. Friends, we should not be looking down on people and trying to judge people for these sins, but rather our hearts should be breaking for people. Why? What did we begin with? The wrath of God is abiding on them. We don't want to see people burning. We don't want to see people experiencing the wrath of God. And that's why we are called to reach out. Okay? It's not that we push people away. We are called to reach out with the gospel. Even though the Supreme Court says that this is okay, the court of heaven says, no, it's not okay. But we are called to love and to reach out to people trapped in this idea, in this suppression, distortion, exchanging the truth. Because the Bible tells us in Corinthians that no homosexual, no idolater, no fornicator will enter the kingdom of God. And we see one last step. He gives them over now to complete perversity. Verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, here it is again, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Finally, God gives them over. That's a scary part when God gives you over to that sin. He says, look, this is the way you want it. This is the way you can have it, and you're going to experience the wrath of God. And he says he gives them over to a debased mind. What's a debased mind? It's a reprobate mind. It's a mind that cannot discharge its proper functions. It, it's used to describe a worthless metal that was polluted by impurities and was ready to be discarded. And what's the character of the debased mind? We see that in verse 29 to 32. There's 21 sins here listed. And we're just going to read them brief, real quickly here. It says, Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. That's quite a list of sins right there, but I want you to notice they know 
the righteous judgment of God. But what do they do? They approve of those who practice them. And friend, what you have today, I'm not trying to get political, but you literally have entire political parties, entire groups approving of these type of behaviors. And God says, no, the wrath of God is abiding on you. Friends, what we have today is people invading the halls of academia, invading the halls of our legislation. They're trying to get legal status to approve of this wickedness. And what happens is they try to force it upon people and say, look, if you don't approve of this, if you don't approve of this, if you don't applaud it, you're, you're insensitive, you're intolerant, you're hateful, and you're, you're, you're labeled as some type of a bigot, okay? But listen, this is a debased mind, friend. And God says, I gave them over to this, and it is not acceptable. You can boil this, all these sins down. You, you know what you can boil this down to? is when you start calling good evil and evil good. And you can see that happening today. There's this idea now of, uh, they're calling it rep reparations, okay? And basically what, basically what this is really, really saying, to get down to the nuts and bolts of that, is saying, well, you know, it's okay to steal. It's okay to loot. That's basically what that's saying. And you can see, we're calling evil good. That's exactly what is happening, friends. What does this all mean for us? It means the wrath of God is being revealed. But there's hope. There is hope in Jesus Christ, friends. Because that list of sins that we just read off, it described many of us sit, stand, sitting, sit, standing here and sitting here. That described who we are were. I want to conclude here, and I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. This is a wonderful, wonderful passage as we come to the communion table here. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to pick it up in verse uh, 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Paul writes, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. But here it is, friends. Listen to this. Oh, it's glorious. And such were some of you. But you were washed but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Is that not glorious, friends? He said, that was some of us. That was us. But because of Jesus Christ, because of the blood, because of the water, the water of his word, we have been washed we have been sanctified. We have been justified. Friends, Jesus loves the sinner. That's why he came. He said, I came to seek and to save those who are lost. He came to heal the brokenhearted. He came to set the captive free. And friend, he offers grace and forgiveness to all of us today. And friends, as we look at this world that we live in today, we see a massive case of truth decay going on right before our very eyes. So what are we to do? 
The Bible calls us to be salt. And salt is a preserving agent in the midst of decay. And friends, we have to speak the truth in love. We have to stand for the truth. But most of all, we have to love the truth who is Jesus Christ. Friends, what Paul is doing here, he's laying some groundwork. And I want you to think as we continue through the book of Romans, Paul's like, he's like, in, he's in a courtroom session, basically. And he's bringing people out onto the carpet and he's pronouncing things upon them. And as we see, as we go through these next chapters, you're going to see different people brought onto the carpet and Paul's going to pronounce verdicts on them, so to speak. But you're going to see the grace of God win out. And friends, in the midst of our culture, we are called to be the salt of the earth. And today, as we go through the book of Romans, as we come to the communion table, and as we think about the wrath of Almighty God, maybe today you say, you know, that's me. I think the wrath of God is abiding on me. I've never asked Jesus Christ for forgiveness. I've come to church for years. I've sat in a pew. I've listened to sermons but I don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And I don't want the wrath of God to abide on me. I want the forgiveness. I want the substitutionary death of Jesus to take the wrath that I deserve. He's offering that today. And as the musicians come up to play before the communion song, if you want to pray, if you want to give your heart to Jesus today, and you say, I don't want to experience the wrath of God, I will be up here and we will pray with you, and you can receive the grace and mercy of Jesus today. Amen? Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for these words, Lord. Words that are they're hard to hear, Father, because um, the truth does hurt at times. But we know, Lord, that your word declares that the truth also sets us free. So, Lord, we thank you for the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. We thank you for the freedom that your spirit gives to us each and every day, that we no longer have to be in bondage to these sins, that we have been washed, that we have been sanctified, that we have been justified, not because we earned it, not because we deserve it, but because you loved us and your grace is enough, Father. I pray for anybody here today who doesn't know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, who has not received the gift of salvation that He came to give to each and every one of His children, that today would be the day that the Spirit of God would touch your heart to receive the eternal gift of salvation. Because, Lord, we understand that we can't do it, but You already did it for us. We simply have to receive it and turn from our wicked ways and allow You to be the Lord of our life. And we pray this in Jesus' name.